Green shinies. Both the beginning and the end, everyone. Or nowadays, perhaps they might just lead us to the beginning of the end, better yet. Drama aside, though, it's well known that green gems are well sought after. But how could something that goes into literally two real crafts matter so dang much? Well, let's find out, I suppose. The sources, uses, and more coming at ya. So make notes. And if you've been paying attention to any of our other gem guides as of late, you already know where to begin, I'm sure. Tumbleweeds. Now, while they may not be the most efficient source out there, they are certainly the safest, and maybe most accessible too. And sure, a whopping 0.02% chance doesn't seem that enticing. But hey, chances are you'll be walking away with some other really useful loot regardless, so take it or leave it I suppose. But try not to stray too far either, as Dragonfly herself drops a guaranteed green gem with a chance at a second too. Plus, she respawns every 20 days by default, so while this is a definite step up from Tumbleweed for Pete's sake, it is much more reliable at the end of the day. Still, much safer sources exist, so don't go thinking that I'm wholeheartedly advocating just going a big fiery fly for all your shiny needs. In fact, even though I have ragged on them in the past, sunken chests here are arguably our second best option for all sorts of gems here on the surface. Green gems included. Sure, one has to actually find Pearl, then get a pinching winch, and then actually find another message to even spawn one of these things to then have to sail to them. But with two separate rolls at a chance at a green gem, along with a pretty decent mess of other loot too, I might actually start to say that these might actually be worth the trouble. It's up to you though. I really think it's just going to come down to how you feel about sailing in this game. But yes, enough faffing about here. It's Ruins time. If we want some of our best chances at a multitude of gems, then it is the best place to be. As pretty much everywhere you look, there's going to be a source of the stuff. Like broken clockworks here, for example. Now we should beware of the chance to spawn a not so broken clockwork, but with a 5% chance at a green gem, it's not bad. Especially considering just how many we're gonna be encountering. Oh, and their renewability, but more on that in the bits. Ancient statues can also drop green gems down here, but only do so if they actually generated with an actual green gem socketed at their base or at the end of their staff. Yes, folks, we can tell what gem we'll be getting from these things before we even smash them to bits. So make note there. They don't just drop whatever gem they want. Ornate chests, on the other hand, are going to be an absolute mystery up until we actually open them. And we might possibly trigger a trap in the process too, so be very mindful there. But we have a 7% chance at a single green gem each. So you'll really just have to decide if it's worth it for you while you are navigating both the labyrinth here or even the atrium. As yes, some ornate chests actually spawn there too. Better yet though, maybe reach the end of the labyrinth and vanquish the ancient guardian to be rewarded with a very large ornate chest. And this thing can be filled with an insane amount of really good loot. Gems included, of course. But it is a kind of one and done deal for the most part. More on what I mean in a minute here. As we've got broken ancient pseudoscience stations still, as they too can drop green gems. However, they only have a 0.56% chance of doing so, so I would not rely on them. Especially when you'll encounter more bad rolls than good at the end of the day, as well as the fact that these stations are also a one-time deal for the time being. But cave holes follow suit, and with a mere 3% chance to generate with but a single green gem, I would only think of these things as a last resort, or super gimmicky bonus if you got nothing else to deplete in the ruins if you know what I mean. And lastly, relics. More specifically, the table and chair variants of the stuff. Now we've got a 0.2% chance at a potential green gem drop from them. And if you have no bloody clue as to what I'm going on about, then you're definitely not alone. Relics are kind of weird. They're also not renewable through a Fuel Weaver kill and Ruins reset, so there's that. 
Oh, and speaking of that, everything but said relics are indeed renewable, folks. So while it's not the easiest way to keep the gems dropping, of course, it's definitely the biggest, and it's what we've got to work with, so good luck. Ah, but it's craft time now. And believe it or not, things are pretty simple when it comes to green gem crafts. We've only got two to work with, and the two go together like peas and carrots, essentially. Construction amulets will cost dual sight, nightmare fuel, and a single green gem while a deconstruction staff will cost nightmare fuel, living logs, and of course a couple green gems at the end of the day. And it's like I said at the start, they're both the beginning and the end. Like the construction amulet here for example. Notice how a thule sight suit here costs 6 thule sight and 4 nightmare fuel. Well, craft and toss on a construction amulet to immediately half the needed materials to 3 and 2 respectively. So before you even begin the craft, this thing's got you covered. And yup, that's about it really. An amulet is just gonna have resources needed to craft most anything in the entire game. But it only has five uses, mind you. Now the deconstruction staff on the other hand has a bit more going for it, so hold on to your butts. As it works differently on different types of crafts, like structures here for example. For you see, when we use a staff on a craftable structure, we see a return of 100% of the materials needed to actually create it initially. Period. But when we use it on an item, it all comes down to said item's durability. And the lower it is, the less resources you will get in return. Full durability items will drop all materials, half durability ones will drop roughly half, and so on you get the picture. Note however, any item that needs gems in its craft will not actually drop said gems when deconstructed so be sure to use them wisely. But to continue, very few things can't actually be deconstructed in this game, but placed walls and the houndiest shootiest specifically are some of them, which is kind of odd in my opinion, but oh well. Ah, but here's where the real fun begins. Item duplication with the deconstruction staff. You see how scale flooring costs one dragonfly scale and two cutstone for a total of six turf per craft? Yeah. We can then choose to drop all six and deconstruct them individually to walk away with the potential six scales total, which will be a net of five scales at the end of the day. Very, very nice. And this could very well go beyond dragonfly scales too, with Thule Sight even. And with the use of a construction amulet of course, we could craft five Thule Sight suits at a discount cost, and then turn around to deconstruct them immediately for a net of three Thule Sight and two Nightmare Fuel for each suit. Yup. It's a thing, everyone, and it's why the Ami and Staff are a one-two punch sort of deal. But to continue even further here, the Staff can help preserve some of the game's rarest resources and crafts themselves, like Mandrakes and Pan Flutes, for example. For you see, let a flute run out of uses and both are gone for good. But deconstruct one, and even at one use, you'll still keep a Mandrake at the ready. Good stuff. But this last use is even better, folks, and definitely worth noting. Deconstructing a Mooncaller Staff for an Iridescent Gem, and how it will help us now progress through the new endgame of Don't Starve Together. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, this is the only way to progress. Yup, green gems are now 100% essential, folks. Make notes. But some actual final notes, however. We can choose to create a green moon's lens, of course, with a cratered moon rock and green gem itself, but since no actual specific craft requires a green moon lens, it is just a map marker, really. We can also power what known as gem raiders with green gems, but who in their bloody right mind would do such a thing? And finally, the changes to the Crab King when green gems are actually used over others to start his fight, of course. And simply put, he'll spawn more claws that will have more health, and more will attach to your boat and mess it up even more than they already freaking do. So trust me. Just take the purple gems for Pete's sake. But there you have it everyone. Green gems and their sources and uses within Don't Starve Together here. And honestly, I think the crafts and their specific uses spoke for themselves. So I'll be leaving it here. Thanks for watching folks. Well wishes to all. Build it up or tear it down. And I'll see ya in the next one. Bye bye.